Open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 2. We uh, started last week in the book of Exodus. We're going to be in the book of Exodus till we, till we finish it. Um, so today will be Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Many of you know about a significant event that happened in my life, Um, in in case you don't, April 18th, 2001. um, My dad was taking me to school. I was nine years old. He was driving me to school that morning. I was in third grade, and um, we went our usual route to school, and um, at some point on the drive, I fell asleep. Um, And when I awoke from sleep, I was not in dad's truck. I was in in a room, um, and I was in a lot of pain. Um, I was screaming at the top of my lungs as in so much pain. I recognized my mom was in the room, but that's all I really knew. Um, There were a ton of people over the top of me, and I had a horrible pain below my waist. Um, I was in the ER, and they were trying to insert a catheter in me. That's the pain I was feeling. And I put up such a fight in that that they were never able to successfully get the catheter in, and they had to come up with another solution. Apparently, my dad had been driving to school, and he had driven up a hill, and another car came up over the hill the other side. That he couldn't see him, and um, he was that car was passing in a no passing zone, and was not back over. And my dad and them hit head on at several miles per hour. Um, we weren't wearing seat belts at the time because it was 2001, and that was not a law at the time. Um, and Dad's truck felt really uncomfortable to wear a seat belt in. I remember, and so in the Thankfully, we weren't wearing seatbelts that day, because in the split second, my dad had to act. He dove on top of me to protect me, and that actually saved his life from the steering wheel crushing him. Um, Him diving on top of me protected me from too much damage. I had a broken nose, some facial fractures, a fractured thumb, and a black eye. That was about the extent of my injuries. Um, I was sent to the hospital in my hometown immediately. Um, That's where I was when I woke up. My dad was life flighted an hour away to Owensboro, Kentucky. Um, He was in way worse shape than I was. Um, One of his legs was jammed up into his pelvis, breaking his pelvis. Um, One of his legs, the other one, I I, I can't remember which one, um, one of them had bones broken out of his leg. Um, One of my dad's feet is dead. If you don't know what that means, how your foot feels when it falls asleep, that's that's how my dad's foot feels like all the time. Um, It's felt that way for 22 years at this point. Um, His jaw was damaged to where even to this day when he bites down, his teeth don't meet. So when you bite down, like your teeth meet, right? His don't. They're like a little off. Um, Several of his teeth got knocked out. And on top of that, he had a stroke in the hospital once they got him there. I was eventually driven by ambulance to Owensboro as well. I remember being led down the hall to my dad's room by some, I think, my grandparents and I'm walking in the room and seeing several people that I knew all around my dad's bed and him really messed up in the hospital bed. I remember he gave me thumbs up and smiled at me. Um, but what was happening to my life? What was going on? What was this bad dream I was in? I was in the hospital for a few days. I got released. I got to go home. I was out of school for, I think, a month. I remember I got to miss standardized testing that year. Um, a lot of students were jealous, I think. But um, my dad was transferred to Louisville, Kentucky. And he was there in the hospital for several months. The next several months consisted of me going back and forth between staying with my mom and, uh, you know, at our home and then staying with my grandparents at their home. My mom would go up and be with my dad for a little bit. Then my grandparents would go up. They would keep swapping out. My dad was finally brought home. And over the next several years, he recovered. My dad was 38 years old when this wreck happened. um, And he went from being in a wheelchair to being on a walker, to having crutches, to walking with a cane. Um, Today, he still walks with a limp, um, and he still has a lot of injuries and is in a lot of pain a lot of time, things that will never heal. Um, He is disabled, and he does what he can, but he has not had a full-time job since since before that wreck. He's one of the toughest men I know. He was a tobacco farmer, he was a mechanic, he was a coal miner, he was a construction worker all in his first 38 years of life. He has a toughness that I will never have, but his strength is much less now because of that wreck. 
So when something like that happens to you, it makes you have to consider much longer how a verse like Romans 8.28 can be true. You know Romans 8.28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. That's a very easy verse to believe when everything's going well for you. It's a very easy verse to use to comfort others when they're going through tragedy. But what about when the tragedy hits you? Is that, uh, is that verse an easy verse to cling to? How is God working that head-on collision for, for my good and my dad's good? Because it's not really a happy ending. Uh, my dad didn't fully recover, and now he runs the Boston Marathon or anything. Like, that's not, that's not how the story turned out. He's been disabled for 22 years. He's had an asleep foot for 22 years, and he will be like that for the rest of his life. In fact, as he gets older, he'll probably get worse and worse as his body ages. That wreck is probably one of the biggest milestone events of my life. I can see how my life probably wouldn't have turned out the same had I not been in that wreck. But imagine you're my dad. You experience this pain every single day. You can't do, you can't do what you used to be able to do. And it's been like that for 22 years and will be for the rest of your life. How do you trust Romans 8.28 then? Will you rely on the hope that God is always working behind the scenes, even in the tragedies of your life? He is sovereign. He's in control. He's working. But you may not see it. You may not see it. We see an example of that in Exodus chapter 2. So let's read the first 10 verses, a story you're very familiar with, I'm sure. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river bank. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her young woman, while her young women walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman, and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Hey, shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. So remember where we left off, verse 22 of chapter 1. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. So Pharaoh's just put out an edict to all the Egyptians, kill every Hebrew-born son. Every son that is born, toss him in the Nile River. So imagine it. You are a Hebrew husband and wife. You've been wanting a child for so long, and you get pregnant. The pregnancy is going well. At about eight and a half months, this edict goes out. So you're nervously awaiting the birth. If it's a girl, you get to keep your child. If it's a boy, he's going to be hunted by your neighbors every day. The people of Israel are watching their newborn babies be yanked from their arms and thrown into the Nile River. A moment that should be so joyful of a baby being born is a horrible experience. That is their experience. This is not just something they're seeing on the news. This is really happening to them and their neighbors. It must be easy for them to ask, where is God? Why doesn't he come and stop this? Well, God moves in mysterious ways. He's always working but he doesn't always work the way we want him to. And he doesn't always work at the speed that we want him to. God is working in this child massacre that's happening. So a son is born. A son is born. A woman conceives and bears a son during this time. And they notice it says they, they see their child and he was a fine child, verse 2. It doesn't come off that way in, in, 
uh, the, the book in the English, but the Hebrew for this verse is something like, she saw that he was good. He, she saw that he was good. That's calling back to what? Genesis. God saw that it was good. He made everything and he saw that it was good. God made creation and saw that it was good. And the birth of Moses is, a, is another chance at new creation, a new chance for the people of God to thrive. When darkness is currently over the face of the deep, light is about to come. And just like with Genesis, that there's a shadow, uh, just like with chapter 1, there's a shadow of Genesis 3.15 being fulfilled here. The, the descendant of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent. That's going to ultimately be fulfilled in Jesus, but there's going to be lesser times when a deliverer is born that's going to rescue people from, from um, the hands of the devil. The edict has been put out to kill sons, and this is a son. So they have to come up with a plan to protect this boy. So they hide him. They hide him, which is a spectacular feat in itself. Can you imagine hiding a newborn baby from literally everyone around you? They didn't have sound machines to block out the noise. Like, they didn't have cars that they could sneak in and get him in and take off. No, they just have to smuggle this baby around. They do this for three months. Um which is there in verse 2, they do this for three months, and then it comes to a moment when they can no longer hide him. Maybe, maybe he, because he's got older and he's a lot more active, or maybe because someone found out about him. Maybe someone found out about him, and so they have to quickly come up with a plan. So they have to do something to protect him. So they come up with the famous basket. They're going to put him in a basket, and they're going to send him down the Nile River. And just at an observation of this, let's say you've never heard this story before, because you're probably really familiar with this story, but let's say you haven't heard it. Um, does that seem like a good idea? Like, like this is kind of like the Kryptonians putting baby Superman in a spacecraft and launching him out into space, but they had Earth set as his destination. They don't know where this kid's going to end up. Like, he might go off a waterfall for all they know. Like, is this really a good idea? They just put the baby in a basket, send him down the river with no plan of what's going to happen. Would you ever do this with a newborn? I think we can see that it, it was at least a good idea to them. Here's why. We always call this a basket that Moses has put in, but it probably wasn't actually a basket. Here's why. The English translators translate it basket. Any of you got a King James version? What does it call it? None of you have a King James Version, apparently. A King, the King James Version translated not basket, but ark. 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 It's the same Hebrew word as in Genesis 6 through 8 that Noah built to be safe from the flood. It's an ark. The, that, that's what's being done here. And in fact, the mother's constructing this just like Noah did. Look, she, um, verse, verse 3, she... Um, Dobs it with pitch. That's what Moses did. He's making it, that's what Noah did. He's making it waterproof. It's smaller. This is a much smaller ark than Noah built. It doesn't need room for all the animals, but it's an ark. It's not a basket like what you would take a, you know, a picnic to the park in. Don't, don't picture that. Because I've always thought to myself, how is that going to keep water out? It's got little holes all around it. No, this is, this is an ark. They, they built a tiny ark. So perhaps... This isn't that much of a shot in the dark. Perhaps in a day when people didn't have cable and Netflix and podcasts to entertain themselves, the way they entertained themselves was to share the stories of their history. And so perhaps this family had heard the story of Noah so much that it sparked an idea in them to do this very thing. So they made an ark, and they put their son in it, and they sent him down the river. It's not a dream situation, but it's, it's better than the kid being killed. She sends him out, trusting that God saved Noah in an ark, so hopefully he will do the same for Moses. It's ironic, actually. All the kids are being killed by thrown, be, being thrown into the Nile, so she puts him in a box and puts him in the Nile. The Nile is what's used to kill most of these boys. It's what's used to save Moses. He's put, it says, verse 3, among the reeds. That could be a passing detail, but in Exodus 13 later, we're going to see later on, when the people are about to cross the water and, you know, the, the, the parting of the Red Sea, 
Um, the Red Sea there could also have been called the, the, the Sea of Reeds. So here at the beginning um, of Israel's deliverance, it's going to mirror when they're actually delivered by water among the reeds. What's happening to Moses here is something like a preview for what's going to happen for the whole nation. They're going to be delivered through the water. So Moses floats, starts floating down the river, and his sister Miriam follows the ark. She's like walking along the riverbed, watching the whole time. And wouldn't you know it, the sovereign hand of God directs the ark just as it did with Noah. It winds up at the back door of Pharaoh, it, it, which would be a bad thing, except his daughter is bathing in the river and Pharaoh is nowhere around. His daughter opens up the box and sees the baby, and she has compassion. She doesn't kill it. He doesn't, she doesn't kill him the way the people of Egypt are. She has the perfect opportunity right here at the river, and her dad would be real proud of her, but she has compassion. This is a very wonderful thing. Her compassion makes her be remembered forever. How many specific Egyptian rulers can you name? Probably none. Maybe you know King Ramses, King Tut, but you don't know much about them. You just know those are Egyptian names. But most people know about this girl. Most people know about her because we've all seen movies about this and we've been told about this in Kingdom Kids and we've read this story so many times. And this is one of the many times in Scripture that godly women are extolled. Many say the Bible is oppressive to women because it says things like, wives, submit to your husbands, or I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority in the church. But if you really think the Bible's oppressive to women, you haven't read it. Because so many times in the Bible, it's the courageous women who, um, who, the, who overcome the work of the devil. The Bible's actually a lot harder on us men. It is. Because the natural sinful state of a man is passivity. Us men are called to stand up courageously, and more often than not, we don't. We do like Adam, and we stand there like a moron and watch our wife eat the fruit that she's not supposed to eat, and we do nothing. Which is why most of the service roles in a church are often filled with women than men. God often uses women to accomplish his purposes. You can probably name a lot more women who are godly saints that you know than men. Now you think back in the history of this church, you can probably think of a lot more godly women, right? God often uses women to accomplish his purposes, and women are to be greatly valued because God values them. So Miriam sees this happen. She runs out of the woods. She says, hey, you want me to call a Hebrew woman to come nurse the baby? I just happened to see you there with, with the baby. You want me to do that? And hey, once he's finished nursing, you, you can keep him as your son. So she tells her, go do it. So Miriam goes and gets the mother of Moses and brings her to her own child. And an amazing display of dramatic irony, the mother of Moses gets to nurse him until he's weaned. And it cancels out the edict to kill the child because it's from the king's daughter. So Moses is protected. Not only that, verse 9, she gets paid to do this. She gets paid to nurse her own child. How is that for a setup? right there. Here's the deal. Here's the thing that we don't see in the text that we have to imagine. Um, this doesn't happen for any other Israelite parent in Egypt. They all get their kids thrown into the Nile, so they're suffering. God is working in this situation, but they're not going to see it. Remember how the story of Exodus is going to unfold. Actually, as we work through chapter 2, it's going to fly through time um, 40 years from this moment, Moses is going to leave Egypt. He's going to you know, kill the Egyptian and take off running. 40 more years later, he's going to come back and lead his people out of Egypt. So 80 years are going to pass before they see God's hand at work. Until then, they're going to suffer, and their tragedy is not going to let up. They're not going to see how God is working for their good. Many of them won't see it in their life. It's going to be 80 years they will die having never seen the deliverance. Why does God work like that? I don't know. God works slow. He takes his time. You just have to trust that. God is not in a hurry like we are. 
I am always in a hurry in my life. God is never in a hurry. God is never racing against the clock. He's always on time, and everything plays out at the pace he plans. That's a hard truth to swallow when you're in a situation like these people, but he is sovereign over all things. But we don't always get to see that sovereignty in action. We just have to trust that it's there. One of my favorite preachers, John Piper, is famous for saying, God is always doing 10,000 things in your life, and you may be aware of three of them. He's always doing 10,000 things in your life. You may be aware of three of them. Everything God does is for your good and his glory. And in his infinite wisdom, he knows best how that plays out. And often he takes his time with it. So, verse 10, Moses is brought to Pharaoh's daughter after the nursing is done, maybe a year, two years, who knows how long it took back then, but um, they bring Moses to Pharaoh's daughter, and she calls him a son. She actually names him Moses. Um, she names him Moses. She calls him his, her, her son. That means he has all the rights and privileges of a son. He's essentially the grandson of the king right there. That's a big step up from being hunted by all the citizens of the land to being third in line for the throne. It's going to take a while, but God has put a plan in place to save Israel from oppression here. It's not sudden. It's not explosive. That's how we often want it to be because we imagine God's going to work like an action movie. Like, you know, he's going to work like Die Hard or Mission Impossible or something like that. But more often than not, he works in unexpected, quiet ways. So his solution to the world's problem was a baby born quietly in Bethlehem. And Moses is going to rescue Israel from the inside. We're at a very different place than when this book began. Remember verse 8 of chapter 1. A new king arose in Egypt. He did not remember Joseph. He, think about Joseph's story. Joseph had a similar story to this. He was brought into Egypt as a slave not as a king, as a slave. And he was faithful to the Lord, and the Lord rose him in rank to second in command of Egypt. And he said, he told his brothers, what man used for evil, what you used for evil, God used for good. And now the same thing's happening here. We have a man who's going to spend 40 years in the Egyptian palace and then 40 years in the wilderness until God finally uses him to deliver the people. What what man is using for evil, God is using for good. God knows exactly what he's doing. It may not appear the way you would want it. It may not play out how we would how we would do it if you know if we were God. That's how we think. But if we knew all we if we knew all that God knows about our lives, and the future, we would see things much differently than we do now. Preacher Tim Keller says, God answers your prayers the way you would if you knew all that God knows. God answers your prayers the way you would if you knew all that God knows. And the fact is, God is going to give Egypt exactly what they deserve for what they've done. They went out, out, they went all out and attacked all the babies of Egypt and drowned them in the Nile. And in 80 years, they're all going to lose their firstborn child, and they're all going to get drowned in the Nile, in the in the Red Sea, by God's justice prevailing. That's what's going to happen. It's going to take 80 years to happen, but that's when it's going to happen, and God's going to do it. Yeah, but that doesn't help my current situation. I've got a really bad situation right now, Aaron. Yeah, maybe you're like my dad. Very likely you will not see victory over your current circumstance, whatever it is, in this life. You're right. There may not be any deliverance in this life from your current trial. There may not. The mother of Moses got to nurse Moses and got to know that Moses survived. But all the other Israelite mothers had to have their children ripped from their arms and drowned to death. They didn't see deliverance in this life, but their people would. Their, 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 their people would. You have to recognize that you exist in a grand story bigger than yourself. This life is not, about you, is not just about you and your struggles. There's a grander story of the universe than just you. And that grander story actually meets your deepest need, even if your current trial doesn't end. You see, there would be another person who would experience what Moses did here. All the children were being thrown into the Nile to die. Moses was 
put into the Nile and made to go through the Nile to bring salvation to Israel. Likewise, all of us experience death and tragedy, death and sorrow, and all of those horrible things happen in our world ultimately as the result of sin. It's why we die. It's why we get depressed. It's why we see families torn apart. It's why evil is so prevalent. Everything wrong with the world is a fruit on the tree of sin and death. So God came and chopped down the tree. The river of death is going to take us all. And Jesus came and entered into that river and went through it to bring salvation. Jesus came and dealt a death blow to death itself by going through the river of death. And he came out the other side victorious. Don't you see how he's met your greatest need? And how all your other trials fall under the umbrella of death. And death has been defeated and Jesus lives. So he brings salvation to your spiritual trials. And through repentance and faith, you can know eternal life and you can know death defeated. And he brings joy to your emotional trials. And he brings peace to your relational trials. And he brings promise of future resurrection to your physical trials. You may not experience that now, but you will when resurrection comes. You may not know how the sovereignty of God is playing out in your current life, in your current moment in life, but you find the victory God is providing by looking at the cross of Christ. The cross is your answer. It's the answer for your body and for your soul. Your soul can be saved now, forgiveness of your sins and cleansing, and your body will be saved one day. God has a grand plan that he's working out. You may wish you were going faster. All of us often do but he's working it at the speed that he knows is best for us. And he will, accomplish, he will accomplish all that he intends to do. He will not be late and he will not fail. And he will do it all for your good and his glory. For he works all things, not some things, not a few things. He works all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Let's pray. Father, sometimes our life doesn't feel like, like, like what Moses got to experience. Sometimes it feels like the other Israelites who are watching their own children be killed. And, and we don't understand those times, and they're hard. And, and, and how do we find victory in the midst of that? We do it through the victory that's in Jesus. Because, Lord, he has met our greatest spiritual need, and he will one day meet our greatest physical need in a, in a time when, when he'll wipe away all tears and sorrow and death forever. Until then, we have to wait, and, and we have to have faith, and we have to trust that you are working in us for our good, for your glory, even if we can't see it. Lord, I pray that we would see it. I pray whatever circumstances each of us are going through, we would see the deliverance. We would see the victory now. But if we don't, help us to know that doesn't mean you, are, you have failed or you're late or anything like that. You will do all that you plan and you will deliver us. It just may not be in this life. And so help us to trust you and know that you're in control. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.